Go. <clears throat> Ready? Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Bruce Campbell. I'm the executive director of the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives. With me is Stephen Staples, who's the uh, president of the Rideau Institute. And uh, this morning, we're here to release uh, the report, The Plane That Ate the Canadian Military. Uh, and of course, uh, the report's author, uh, Professor Michael Byers, is also here, and he will speak to it. Michael Byers is the Canada Research Chair in Global Politics and International Law. He's the author of many books and reports, including a report on the F-35s recently uh, published in the Canadian Foreign Policy Journal. This is the latest in a series of military procurement uh, reports that the Rideau Institute and the CCPA have uh, have uh, uh, sponsored. Um, and they cover the gamut from Arctic patrol ships uh, to close combat vehicles uh, to submarines and helicopters. Um, so, um, Monsieur Byers va faire son, ses commentaires initial en anglais, mais il est capable de répondre à vos questions en français. I'm going to hand it over now to Professor Byers. Um, thank you, Bruce. Uh, bonjour à tous. Uh, uh, je peux prendre des questions en français, uh, mais comme uh, Bruce a expliqué, uh, je vais faire mon présentation uh, en anglais. Um, this report is based upon a report that was released by the Department of National Defense in August of last year, August 2013, uh, the uh, Next Generation Fighter Capability Annual Update. And all of my analysis is based on that report, extrapolating from numbers provided by the Department of National Defense. Uh, and it's off. Oops. Okay, yeah, it's off. Sorry. I will start again. Um, this report that I am releasing today is based upon a report that was released by the Department of National Defense in August 2013, the Next Generation Fighter Capability Annual Update. And uh, the numbers that I have generated are based on numbers produced by DND. I'm extrapolating from them and filling in some of the gaps, but I am not uh, going beyond the parameters of uh, the uh, the work uh, done by DND in that report. I'm simply uh, filling in and extrapolating uh, based on their approach. And I uh, discovered two things in digging into the DND update that are of uh, particular uh, concern, and, and that is that uh, the Harper government has uh, consistently uh, based uh, its assessment of the operating cost of F-35s on the operating cost of CF-18s. In other words, all of the projections that we've had from the Harper government, including from the Department of National Defense last summer, all their projections of the operating cost of F-35s are based on the operating costs of our existing fleet of a different aircraft. And that CF-18 number is wrong with respect to F-35s. In fact, it's significantly wrong with respect to F-35s. And the actual operating cost of F-35s used in my report for this analysis is derived from numbers produced by the US government. And you can see the citations in the report. And the difference between the Harper government's number and the actual number based upon US government numbers amounts to, and this is the most interesting initial step, a difference of $11 billion. F-35s have a much higher operating cost than CF-18s for a host of reasons, including the fact that there is a lot more um, uncertain developmental uh, technology in F-35s uh, as compared to the CF-18s. And the US Air Force and Lockheed Martin, the US government are discovering that there is this substantial price difference and so if you take into account those US numbers alone with regards to operating costs, the actual life cycle cost of a fleet of F-35s goes from uh, the DND number of $45 billion to $56 
billion dollars, a significant oversight on the part of the Harper government. There are other actual costs that I discovered that have not been included in the government numbers, um, and you'll see these in Annex 1 of the report. Um, the cost of uh, foreseeable um, weapons expenditures to arm the F-35s add on another $218 million. Modifying Canada's mid-air refueling fleet add on another 42, sorry, $420 million, um, et cetera, et cetera. Once you add those other actual costs, identified by DND in other documents, but not included in the update last summer, you add on another billion dollars, and you get to 57 billion. That's actual cost. So there we have it, $12 billion that the government has not been telling the Canadian taxpayer about. The second part of my report, again building upon the work in the DND update, is to take into account what are called cost risks and uncertainty. And these are things, and you will find them in Annex 2 of my report, these are things like small changes in the exchange rate between the Canadian and US dollars. So if you have a 2%, um, sorry, a if you have an 85 cent dollar as opposed to a 92 cent dollar, all of a sudden you have to add 800 million dollars on to the acquisition cost of a fleet of F-35s. A change of just seven cents in the exchange rate, and you get that kind of increased number. A two percent increase in the rate of inflation adds a billion dollars simply on to the acquisition cost of the aircraft. And through this portion of my report, looking at small changes in readily identifiable uh, cost risks, the exchange rate, the inflation rate, what's called uh, the, the rate of learning and production efficiency with regards to the building of F-35s, possible reductions in the overall number of F-35s ordered around the world, a change in the numbers of flying hours for the fleet. Department of National Defense foresees that a fleet of F-35s would fly significantly fewer hours than our existing fleet of CF-18s. This is based on the assumption that more training will be done on simulators. But the actual fact is that with regards to the F-35s, Lockheed Martin attempted to do a lot of its testing work on the aircraft through computer simulation and discovered that it didn't work, that once they started flying actual aircraft with actual test pilots, that a lot of unforeseen problems arose. So you add this all up, and under a moderate risk scenario, a moderate risk scenario, an $0.85 cent dollar, a 2% increase in inflation, look what happens to the numbers. You go up to $90 billion for the life cycle cost of a fleet of F-35s. Change the risk parameters just slightly. Just slightly go to uh, a 4% increase in inflation. And, and look what happens. You go up to $126 billion. And again, these are not radical changes in inflation, in exchange rate, in learning and productivity factors. Relatively small changes can drive those numbers up to a very significant degree. And compare that $126 billion, or even that $90 billion, to what the government of Canada, to what the Harper government was telling Canadians just four years ago in 2010. $16 billion versus $90 billion, or $126 billion. Now, this is all even more important, because we know that right now a report is sitting on Prime Minister Harper's desk. It's a report produced by the Royal Canadian Air Force in response to a request that he made in 2012 after a damning report from the Auditor General of Canada. He told the Air Force to go back and assess not just the F-35, but to assess the competitor aircraft. And we know that that analysis done by the Royal Canadian Air Force includes an analysis of risk. And so I urge you to read my report, to look at these numbers, to realize that my analysis is based upon early work done by DND last summer. There's nothing extraordinary here. This is simple, cautious, full analysis. Look at these numbers and you have an idea as to what is likely in that report 
sitting on Stephen Harper's desk, the report that he is so far refusing to make public. Why is he refusing it to make public? Well, perhaps because it has numbers like this. So again, I will simply close by saying that my analysis here is not particularly um, unusual, certainly not exaggerated, based on work done by the Department of National Defense, coming to conclusions that are likely the same or similar to the conclusions arrived in by the Royal Canadian Air Force in their latest report. And I call upon Prime Minister Stephen Harper to make the Air Force report public so that that document can be compared with my document so that Canadian taxpayers have a true understanding of the implications of a decision to purchase F-35s. And the final thing I will say, and this is an explanation for the title of my report, The Plane That Ate the Canadian Military. If the F-35s were purchased for Canada, and if they ended up costing $90 billion over their life cycle or $126 billion over their life cycle, those costs would destroy the Canadian military. There would be no money left for anything else. No money for ships. No money for fixed-wing search and rescue aircraft. No money for the Army. No money for training. So this is an important decision facing the Prime Minister that concerns not just the actual impact on taxpayers, but also the impact on the men and women who serve. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Monsieur Byers, peut-être en français, deux, trois questions, assez rapidement. Le gouvernement avait annoncé, comme vous vous en souvenez, cette espèce de reset pour calmer le jeu et au nom de la transparence. Est-ce que vous croyez qu'en ce moment, avec ce que vous venez de décrire, c'est vraiment ce qui est en train de se passer ou ce n'est pas du tout le cas? Est-ce que les Canadiens devraient être inquiets? Alors, je dois dire que c'est possible de faire une analyse comme ça au cause de transparence limitée, parce que les, les numéros que j'utilise sont publiés par le ministère de, de, de Défense nationale. Alors, le rapport de, de l'été passé me donne la chance de faire ma recherche, de, 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 de donner les numéros comme ça. Alors, euh, oui, euh, la situation est mieux euh, euh, après la décision euh, euh, de 2012 de, de euh, renouveler euh, le process euh, de d'analyser de, euh, les, les choix. Uh, des avions différents. Ma question, c'est est-ce que les Canadiens devraient être inquiets? Mais oui, parce que jusqu'à ce moment, le rapport uh, sur les, les risques et les, les, les coûts uh, des avions, uh, le rapport uh, produit uh, par uh, uh, les forces canadiennes uh, reste uh, uh, sur le Uh, le bureau, dans le bureau de, de, de premier ministère. Selon les projections que vous faites ici, uh, ça pourrait être désastreux, que ça pourrait détruire, et c'est le mot que vous avez employé, détruire uh, la défense nationale. Uh, pourquoi? Alors, pouvez-vous uh, imaginer... Oui, oui. oui, oui. Pouvez-vous imaginer... Uh, l'effet uh, d'une coupe comme ça uh, de, de 126 uh, uh, milliards de dollars uh, arrivé uh, un peu par surprise uh, uh, sur le, le gouvernement canadien. Qui va payer pour ça? Bien sûr, le militaire canadien. Et comment est-ce que le, le militaire canadien peut payer pour un autre uh, 80 uh, milliards de dollars? couper les autres, les autres choses, les navires, les avions euh, pour, euh, pour sauvetage. Alors, bien sûr, ça va imposer les décisions impossibles sur les forces canadiennes. Et ça, c'est un de, de mes points. Euh, c'est très important de, 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 
de savoir que ce n'est pas seulement une question d'écoute des, des, des imposée euh, sur tous les Canadiens, mais c'est aussi une question sur l'avenir des forces canadiennes. Est-ce que nous voulons des forces canadiennes avec seulement une pièce d'équipement moderne, ça veut dire les, les F-35, ou est-ce que nous voulons un militaire canadien avec euh, euh, un grand complément d'équipement différent pour faire toutes les missions différentes? Les décisions d'avancer avec les, les F-35, c'est une décision d'avoir des forces canadiennes tellement spécialisées sur une mission, la mission des, des F-35. Les Japonais, les South Koreans, les Australiens maintenant ont tous annoncé qu'ils vont acheter les F-35 et ils n'ont pas trouvé des chiffres qui sont anything close to, to your projections. Um, And their media haven't seemed to be, haven't seemed to be able to uh, uh, dig up anything close to that. Uh, why are your numbers so high and their numbers so low? My numbers are not high compared to numbers in the United States. If you go into, uh, for instance, the Government uh, Accountability Office reports on the F-35, you will find that my numbers are entirely consistent with the analysis done by government experts in the United States. Okay, I'm not talking about think tanks. Government exports in the GAO coming up with these kinds of numbers. Now, I'm not going to make any apologies for the Australian or the South Korean mili military or media in terms of perhaps not producing numbers this high. What I can say is that the Australian purchase of F-35s is still lower than their original anticipated total of F-35s. They're only buying 72 instead of the 100 originally projected. So when Lockheed Martin puts out the story that yes, Australia is carrying this project forward, well, there's another side to that story. Australia is purchasing less F-35s than it had originally planned to do. And you can look at this in different ways. And the point to take home out of this is that there still remains enormous uncertainty. We don't know how many F-35s will be ordered in the end, and as a result, we do not know what the per plane cost will be. We do not know when the development phase will end, or if it will end, because there are still major developmental problems, particularly with regards to software code. So we don't know when the, um, the cost will be reduced as a result of getting to the, the end of that developmental phase. So we do not know what the planes will actually cost. We need to plan for these uncertainties. So for instance, when I look at the D&D update, and I find that the only contingency plan with regards to acquisition price is to buy fewer plants. And yet D&D tells us that, 30, so that 65 is the absolute minimal number for an operational fleet, I get worried. When I look at the only contingency plan in the D&D update with regards to operating cost is to fly fewer hours, I get very concerned because they're already planning to fly significantly fewer hours than they fly for the CF-18. So, You know, we have to plan for uncertainty, and, and any government looking at this will come to the exact same conclusion that Auditor General Sheila Fraser came to in 2010, and I, I simply want to quote, I hope no one is assessing this as low risk. She's speaking about the F-35 procurement. These are planes that are still in the development phase, that are massively delayed, with huge uncertainties, and the Canadian government is approaching this as something that involves the very low end of risk. And it's irresponsible to treat this as a low risk project, given that it is a developmental aircraft with an awful lot of uncertainty. And therefore, the upper level risk numbers need to be in the picture as well. The, the numbers that you looked at in the US, would they be for all three models of the F-35, just the F-35A? Um, and in addition to that kind of a, a, a side question to all of that is, I mean, you've come up with your numbers, you've filled in the gaps, as you've, as mm -hmm. you've said, um, based on whatever your assumptions were and whatever numbers you've seen. Uh, I, I guess you're asking us to look at those projections and compare them against KPMG. I mean, did KPMG not do a proper job? I don't know. KPMG assumed that the operating cost of F-35s would be the same as CF-18s. Um, and in uh, counterpoint to that, I'm not only um, quoting from uh, uh, US government uh, reports, I also quote from Lori Hahn, MP, 
who told the, I believe it was Canadian press, that uh, the uh, operating costs of, uh, of uh, the, the CF-18s were, I believe it was $19,000 per hour, which gives us a fix compared to uh, the numbers for the actual F-35 generated by Lockheed Martin. So I'm comparing Lurie Hahn MP's number with Lockheed Martin's number. Okay, I'm not spinning this. There is a more than $10,000 per hour difference in operating costs between those two. That's the kind of analysis I'm doing. I'm not making anything up here. No, but on, on, the, on, the F3, on the ABC models? On the ABC models, yes, I take that into account. It's, it's all in my research. Uh, yes, there is a distinction, and so I'm very, very careful to parse this out. This involves months of work, my analysis here, and I invite you to dig deep into my numbers, to dig deep into my citations. It's all 100% solid, I assure you. Well, uh, thank you for the plug. You've got it in here. It was the Hill Times that got the quote from Lori Hahn on 19 Sorry. grand, uh, which was important anyway. So is the 10% inflation rate constant, for instance? Yeah, I, I don't. Uh, I don't use a 10% a, 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 a inflation rate. Uh, what I do is I take the D&D updates number for a 1% increase in inflation. So that's 1% increase over the life cycle. So the 1% more than the current inflation rate spread over the next 30 years. D&D gives me that number, right? Now I think a 1% increase in inflation is a very conservative number given what we know of current inflation rates versus historic inflation rates. So in my moderate scenario, I use a 2% increase. In my serious scenario, I use a 4% increase. Okay, but that still only takes us up to about 6% inflation, right? Uh, and, and I, you know, I'm old enough to remember 10% plus inflation rates. Um, same thing on the exchange rate. Uh, you know, the DND update uses 91 cents per dollar, Canadian per US dollar. Um, that's not going to, to stay the same. I remember when I moved back to Canada from the United States 10 years ago, that we were at a 60 cent US dollar. We, we get massive fluctuations. Take, for instance, another uh, variable, which is the cost of aviation fuel. The cost of aviation fuel has risen by 40% in the last 10 years, right? And we know that it's likely to go higher because of diminishing accessibility to conventional oil, right? So that has to be factored in. D&D gives me a, a number for a 10% increase in the cost of aviation fuel. So I say, well, what happens if it goes up 50%? from it's kerosene isn't it uh yeah it's, it, uh, yeah um the uh goes from uh, roughly 80 cents in your scenario up to three dollars that's quite significant uh no i don't go up to three dollars I, I i i go the highest i go is a doubling of the number given in the dnd update the current number okay i do mention in this update and in, in, in my report and this is important that when I do my scenarios, I'm looking at an accumulation of small changes. But you could get very quickly to the same number with just one large change. And so I do give an example of $3 per liter. With $3 per liter, now, this just goes off the chart. right? If I were to put in um, large changes to these variables, I'd be standing in front of you talking about $200 billion, $300 billion. I haven't done that. This is very conservative, my analysis. I'm looking at totally foreseeable changes. And I still generate large numbers, which is why Canadian taxpayers need to be worried. And, and let me also say this, because I know that, that otherwise someone will ask. I have not done the same analysis with regards to the competitor aircraft. I don't have the kind of, of resources uh, and staff that the Department of National Defense does. But I am pretty confident that the numbers would be smaller for a couple of reasons. One is that we already know that the F-35 has unusually high operating and sustainment costs, okay, compared to the other aircraft. But more importantly, the F-35 is still in the developmental phase. It's still not a finished aircraft, and that increases the risk even more. So I would hope that the report that is sitting on the Prime Minister's desk from the Royal Canadian Air Force does this kind of analysis with regards to all the alternative aircraft so that we get the full final numbers for comparison reasons. That's what I hope is there. I've just done the F-35 because I only had the numbers for the F-35 because that is the only thing that was in the D&D update. <laughs> report you're speaking of, that's the uh, result of the industry analysis? Yeah, the, 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 the options analysis 
Yeah, it's called the options analysis. It's done by the National uh, uh, Next Generation Fighter uh, uh, Capability. Uh, sorry, it's the, the, the Next Generation Fighter Office uh, Secretariat. Uh, and the report itself um, is written by the Royal Canadian Air Force with the oversight of uh, an independent uh, uh, review committee. And, and this is the report that we were promised two years ago after the Auditor General exposed that there had been some misleading numbers presented to, to Parliament. Ce rapport qui n'a toujours pas été rendu public, est-ce que vous croyez que le gouvernement a, a quelque chose à cacher? Uh, J'espère pas, mais, mais je crois oui. Um, parce que uh, les, les numéros sont, sont, assez, sont assez larges. Mais certainement. Et l'urgence, ça, 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 ça vient de, de fait que uh, les avions uh, qui sont présentement uh, uh, dans les forces canadiennes sont très âgés. Uh, les uh, CF-18 uh, 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 seront uh, uh, démissionnés uh, bientôt. The, the CF-18 fleet is due for retirement in 2020. Um, and, and, and we not only need to get the numbers right in terms of, of actual cost, in terms of risk, uh, to know whether this is a, a feasible plan. I don't think the F-35 is financially feasible. And we need to look at the alternatives because we need replacements. Um, and, and I am a supporter of recapitalizing Canada's fighter jet fleet. I want a decision relatively quickly, and I want it to be a decision based upon a full analysis, which includes cost, risk, and uncertainty. I hope that the, uh, that, that the uh, report uh, produced by the Royal Canadian Air Force and currently in the Prime Minister's office will give us some clear bases for a decision. But we won't know that unless it's made public. Justement, là, juste, c'était ma dernière question. Ce que j'allais vous demander, c'est que vous dites qu'il y a urgence de produire ce rapport-là. Mais vous, là, dans votre tête, croyez-vous que le gouvernement va prendre une décision avant les prochaines élections et tenter d'éviter peut-être de ne pas rouvrir ce débat très controversé? Je ne pense pas que nous avons le temps d'avoir de, de, une autre pause comme ça. Uh, il y a un, un rapport produit par le, le, le ministère de, de Défense nationale uh, dans le bureau du premier ministre. Ça donne l'information importante. Nous n'avons pas le temps parce que les, les, les avions uh, présentement uh, de, de, des forces canadiennes sont très âgés. Alors, c'est temps maintenant de faire une décision. Ça peut être une décision de, de choisir un avion. Peut-être le Super Hornet, c'est presque le même avion que le CF-18 très modernisé. Peut-être euh, de choisir le, le F-35, euh, mais à mon avis, ce n'est pas une bonne décision. Ou d'avoir une compétition ouverte. Mais comment c'est ça tout de suite? We need to have action on this. The, the CF-18s only have a few more years of available service. Uh, we're using some of them right now in Eastern Europe. We need some capacity like this. And because of a decade or more of delays on the part of successive Canadian governments, we're in a real box now. The, the, the choice that successive governments was aiming for, the F-35, is proving unfeasible financially, technologically. And we need a replacement, and the Prime Minister needs to decide. We need to get moving on this file. There is no more time for delay. Thank you very much. Merci. Thank you.